Welcome to Magnets, everyone. Uh, today's seminar on the 24th of July, 2024. Uh, we're going to have a format, same as usual, where we have a 25 to 30 minute presentation. For this, please keep your microphones muted. And if you're having a poor connection, turn off your video. Then we've got uh, 10 to 15 minutes of questions and discussion. You can ask a question by raising your hand. Uh, and then I'll call for you, or you can ask a text question in the chat. Um, and then at the end, we'll turn the videos off, and then there's time for an informal catch-up where everyone can chat to one another. So today, we've got Romy Meyer from Utrecht, and she is going to talk to us about local magnetic anomalies on Mount Etna and how those explain biases in paleomagnetic data. So with that, I will hand over to Romy. Um, yeah, thank you for inviting me for this talk. Uh, I'm sorry that my camera is not working, but... <laughs> um, uh, my name is Romy. I'm a PhD candidate at the Paleomagnetic Laboratory for the Hoofdijk at Utrecht in the Netherlands. And in this talk, I will show you the research we did at the start of my PhD project, um, which was for me very interesting to understand the best ways to sample during later paleomagnetic fieldworks. So this, ah, yes. Um, this research was published in April this year, together with Leonard Groot. And in our study, we looked at the bias that's found in data from Mount Etna, and uh, whether that can be explained by local magnetic anomalies. Um, so um, where is the Etna? It's located here in Sicily, in Italy, and it's a very recent volcano. It has erupted a lot of times in the recent past, also in July. Um, and there's a lot of recent uh, volcanic flows that have been studied very well. But there is a problem with the paleomagnetic results from these recent volcanic flows. Previous studies, they detect a large scatter in directions from results from a single site. And there is a, a large paleomagnetic data set that is often inconsistent with the reference value. This is reflected in an inclinations being too shallow and paleo intensities are found to be too low. And these previous studies attributed this, for example, to cooling rate differences, uh, multi-domain behavior or trans-domain processes. But some of them also mentioned that it could be caused by local magnetic anomalies. And local magnetic anomalies are um, disturbances of the magnetic field above the surface of a lava flow caused by the uh, strongly magnetized terrain below it. And this has been studied before. So local magnetic anomalies or the magnetic terrain effect, as others call it, is, for example, studied by Bach in 1995 of Hawaii. They made two-dimensional models of the field above uh, the lava flows. So the top two are results from models in the Northern Hemisphere, and the bottom two are results from uh, lava flows in the Southern Hemisphere. And these are models of valleys. And they conclude that they found negative inclination anomalies in topographic lows in the Northern Hemisphere, but positive inclination anomalies in topographic lows in the Southern Hemisphere. And moreover, they also say that these anomalies only occur when there is an irregular terrain. So when there are large topographic differences, such as these valleys. And the second is uh, Valais and Soler in 1999. Um, they have 132 direct field measurements on La Palma and Tenerife. Um, and these direct field measurements show that there are deflections up to 15 degrees and differences of 20% for intensity. So that's, for example, in the graphs on the right, the top one is intensity versus declination, and this is intensity versus inclination. And we see that there's a cloud, so there's a scatter of uh, declinations, 
but also there's a correlation with intensity being low and inclination low, inclination high and uh, intensity high. And the third is on, La, uh, on Mount Etna. It's from Tangui and the Gulf in 2004. And they measured at 12 different sites, uh, 10 times the magnetic field above the surface. And they concluded that the average of all these measurements came close to the expected field value. But they avoided topographic differences, um, which a future flow will not. And there um, are variations within these sites. They measured one site in a little bit more detail. So this is, uh, well, they did a lot of measurements along the length of a kilometer. The top one is intensity. Then we have inclination and uh, declination at the bottom. And you can see that the average might come close to the actual value, but there are large within site variations of the measurements. And lastly, um, the Groot and the Groot in 2019, you, you know that they are from the fort as well. Um, they did measurements on Mount Etna and they, um, well, they made the device that I use later on to measure the anomalies and they tested the device with a grid of measurements above a lava flow on the left and a road uh, as well with various variation, uh, elevation variations. And on the bottom is the variation in inclination. They measured the field at every orange dot at five centimeters above the lava flow, 100 centimeters above the lava flow, and 180 centimeters above the lava flow. And they found that there's a variation with these measurement heights above the surface. So five centimeters has larger variations in inclination than at 180 centimeters. So the underlying terrain causes variations of inclination. And to continue in this, and because Tangui and Legoff avoid, avoided the topographic differences, we want to test whether these local magnetic anomalies are a bigger influence on the ambient geomagnetic field on Mount Etna than that was previously assumed. So to study this, we first uh, made an overview of what the actual bias in paleomagnetic data is. And in the second part, we mapped the magnetic anomalies. So I want to point out that the first is that declination, inclination, and intensity from volcanic rocks. So those are measurements like lab measurements. And in the second part, it's the declination, inclination, and intensity from direct measurements of the Earth's magnetic field above the surface. So that's what a future uh, lava flow would record. So the bias in the paleomagnetic data, this is the result from all previous studies of flows deposited after 1850. Each dot is a result from a previous study and this is the declination. The black line is the expected value. And there are variations, but it's not, it's sort of around the black line. But for inclination, it's still the black line is the expected value. And except for these two, the rest is all lower than the expected value. And this is the same for the paleo intensity. Some uh, have a higher result than expected, but most previous studies recorded a lower paleo intensity than expected. And if we plot this all in together, we see declination, inclination, intensity, um, differences with the reference value. So zero is absolutely correct. And uh, declination, we see it's approximately distributed around zero. And the median declination was 0 0.8 degrees higher. But for inclination, we already saw it's lower, and the median is 2.9 degrees lower than expected. And the density is 8.8 .8 microtesla lower. So that's problematic for older flows, which we cannot compare with the reference value. And we don't know whether there's such a bias as well um, of inclination and intensity towards lower values. To test whether this is 
caused by local magnetic anomalies. We measured the field at five different locations on the Etna. So those are the flux one to five sites. And these ET sites are uh, the ones in the previous paleomagnetic data set. So at each site, the um, declination was an inclination and intensity was measured with this device on the left. This is a three actual flux gate magnetometer. And the declination is measured by pointing it towards a reference location with the GPS location. And at each site, the um, declination inclination density was measured at different heights above the flow. For the first four sites, it's at 100 and 180 centimeters above the surface. And at the fifth site, that was measured in a little bit more detail at 25, 75, 125 and 175 centimeters. And at each location, the pod, there were three pods that were walked, these blue stripes. Um, and the paths were walked perpendicular to ridges and gullies. So we wanted to obtain uh, large topographic differences. And I will show the results for this path in the middle. This is the result for the declination. And uh, you can see the path was walked from the northwest towards the southeast. The black line is the topography. Um, the dotted line is the expected field value. And these orange and yellow lines are the declination measurements. Um, so approximately every meter a measurement was taken at 100 centimeters and 180 centimeters above the surface. And these gaps in the records are because you need to point the flux gate to a reference location that was not always visible, but that's only the problem with declination. So we see there are large variations, but we couldn't find a correlation with anything, but that's different for the inclination because the inclination measurements follow the topography for most sites. They are higher above the ridges and the values are lower in the gullies. And this is uh, the same for intensity. It's higher above the ridges and the value is lower above the gullies. Although for a lot of the sites, the signal seems to be slightly offset, in this case towards the southeast. Um, we couldn't find a, like a correlation uh, on location on the mountain or anything. But they are lower in the gullies, which is an interesting observation. Um, and on overall, if we look at all sites and all paths that were walked, we found lower than expected declination, inclination, and intensity measurements. So these are for all five sites with the measurement height above the surface of the lava flow and then the median declination, inclination, intensity. So you can see the fifth site was measured in a little bit more detail than the first four. That the declination is lower than the expected value, which is the stripe line, is not as what we saw in the paleomagnetic data, but the declination is most prone to errors because you need to point it to a reference location and it was often discontinuous. So that's a bit the problem with the declination. But the inclination on the other hand is often um, interestingly lower than the expected value and a bit in line with the 2.9 degrees lower inclination. And intensity is lower as well, but um, it's a few microteslas lower. So it's not 8.8 .8 microtesla lower intensity. Um, and in addition to this, we see that a low inclination has the lowest intensity and the high inclination have highest intensity as well. So that um, correlates with each other as well. And the second observation was the variation with measurement height above the surface. So um, this is again the intensity of the last uh, example I gave you. We see that at 100 centimeters above the surface, the variations are larger than when you look at the ones measured at 180 centimeters. And this is even more pronounced for the fifth side with 25 centimeters above the surface. 
um, which reflects that indeed the underlying terrain must cause these large variations. And the third was the correlation with topography. So the higher above ridges and lower in gullies, which is even clearer for in the, uh, inclination. And we tested that with a positive Pearson's correlation. So to take a conclusion out of this, it's mostly, um, well, don't take samples close together because then the chances are higher that you sample the local magnetic anomaly. It's probably a lot of people already do this, but it's better to take samples spread out over a larger area. While this may lead to larger uncertainties and uh, higher scatter, you um, will remain closer to the true value. So it doesn't necessarily mean that if you have a large scatter that you get uh, bad results. But I should also note that in case a new flow would get deposited on this location, I would expect that most of the flow will be deposited in the gullies. So um, then like most part of the flow would have uh, a local, <laughs> local magnetic anomaly um, picked up. So this is the ideal sampling scenario, but it's not always the case and not always possible. So best thing is to report your sampling strategy. Uh, use, of course, some, cam some compasses. Um, say whether you sampled spread out, on top of a flow, in a road cut, um, etc. And the summary of the, my presentation is the first thing that the, the Mount Etna paleomagnetic data yields lower than expected inclinations and intensities. The flux gate magnetometer measurements above the flows show that there are local magnetic anomalies. And these local magnetic anomalies distort the ambient magnetic field. So that's the magnetization that a future flow would record. The 2.9 bias in inclination, that can be explained by local magnetic anomalies. But uh, the flux gate magnetometer measurements show also a low intensity, but that's like often not the 8.8 .8 microtesla lower intensity. So we still uh, can have rock magnetic biases in here. And most important is to report the sampling strategies. And that was my presentation. So if there are questions or discussion, I, uh, I'm happy to hear that. Uh, let's just give uh, Romy a sort of virtual round of applause. Great presentation. Um, and yeah, I will open the floor to any questions that anyone may have. Anik, you have a question. Hi, a uh, very nice presentation. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering what are the lessons for like us sampling really old rocks? Do you have any idea on like how much? It's like the maximum deviation we can expect. Yeah, that's that's interesting. Uh, well, it's I think um, Bach already predicted that it's probably caused by the topographic differences. So if you would, for example, have then flood basalts, it's not well. They don't expect it to occur, and the uh, gullies and bridges measurements of these flux gate measurements also show that these deviations are large when there is a large topographic difference. Um, and it's only with strongly magnetized rocks, so not sedimentary um, influences. Although if you would have a sediment on a volcanic flow, then it's probably worse. <laughs> um, you're sampling in an arc like the Andes or something. Could you but, explain like 20 degree differences or is that too much? Sorry, what did you say the first sentence? Uh, say you're sampling in an arc, uh, like the Andes or something. Um, could you have differences of up to 20 degrees or is that too much? Is it only like less than 10 or? If it's the same, then it could be. But if you would take them like a little bit spread out, if that's possible, I'm I'm not sure about the whole sediment like 
what kind of old <laughs> I only sample recent flows. So. <laughs> oh, fair enough. Thanks. Uh, are there any more questions from anyone? Uh, yeah, I have a, a question. Just um, so the mechanism for this is that the deposits are magnetized, and so they produce in a local magnetic field, right? Yes. So has there been so has, has there been modeling done on how big that effect can be and how? How local it is because it was really interesting to do it at the two different heights. So I'm wondering. Can you, can you repeat that? Um, my audio wasn't very good. Sorry, I'm just. Um, it's a kind of a similar question to Anik's, wondering how big this effect can get, and also how local it is. Um, so you were sampling on scales of each meter. I'm wondering whether, you know, this would, what effect you might see on longer uh longer distances um well i think on longer distances it's you so did, like angui and the gulf have one long distance and there are large variations as well but it's not in so much detail that you hear yeah, this one um that you can see the individual gullies and ridges so in yeah. a larger scale there are large variations as well but they couldn't pinpoint why one was very low and the other one was very high. So in these larger distances, it's it's the same. So you would like to sample, of course, on the very long, but I know that when you're in the field, it's it's often not possible to yeah. do it on a long, like you can spread it out, but not over kilometers. Yeah. How extensive are the flows? How very does one flow? How extensive are the flows? Yeah. Um, well, these are the flows um, that was sampled, well, measured on. So the flows on that now are very large. So if you, in theory, if you did sample like right away along a flow, you yeah. might average out of these effects out. Yeah, but, but then um, you know, bias and you, you would, would of course want things. them like distributed around the volcano, but that's often not possible because the flow will only go in one direction and that's that's it. Mm -hmm. So in 2004, Tongui and Lugov measured it around the volcano and said the average of all these measurements is very close to the true value, but that's not how you would sample in like, or how a new flow would sort of record that field. Yeah. Yeah, really cool work, sorry, it's very interesting. Excuse me, I'll let somebody else have a chance. Does anyone else have any questions? Uh, I'm going to be rude because I can't raise my hand because I'm the host, but um, okay. I've got a couple of couple of questions. One is maybe a sort of easy one and one, one is maybe a slightly more philosophical one. <laughs> um, but it's a really nice talk. Um, have you actually sort of looked and thought about quantifying what effect the variation in the inclination and intensity, uh, what that translates to in terms of a variation of like VDMs? No. That might be worth, <laughs> worth, and it just might, might be worth us sort of looking at at some point because yeah. that kind of gives us an idea of, of what kind of variability or misestimate we might see if we're looking at, at, at older, um, you know, trying to looking at global reconstructions. Yeah, we have a student and she worked on models of like modeling what the uh what would happen with the topography mm. um but i'm well she started even before me i think so i'm not very included in her research so the i mean the other thing i was thinking is you know you, you talk about you know the sampling strategy being kind of really important and trying to sample as widely as possible yeah so that that while you will uh, increase the variability in your results and you'll get larger scatters on average you will be honing down to to the right answer yeah i mean what kind of scatter would would be acceptable you know because most you know 10 percent, 25 percent are kind of two commonly used thresholds for accepting or rejecting data i mean would that mean we need to be a bit more relaxed about with insight scatter um, well, in my experience, so I have 
sampled recent flows on La Palma as well. And for example, that intensity, if you combine the average of all those sites, it has like that sigma divided by the paleo intensity is higher than 20%, which mm. is very high. But then the result is like just, I think 0.2 micro Tesla lower than the expected field value. So it's very like the average of everything was very accurate, but then you would discard the site based on their high uh, sigma. Mm -hmm. And the same from um, three sites of Mexico, the directions, if you combine those, are very accurate, but uh, within site, it's very, it's, there's a large scatter. They don't really let, uh, how would you say that? They're, they're well, clustered. They, yeah, they're clustered. Yeah. yeah. So that's so, what I found interesting of the, the newer sites I sampled on different locations. Hmm. All within the Northern Hemisphere, actually. For, so Bach predicted it's the other way around in the Southern Hemisphere. So I don't know if that's, uh, we okay. didn't look into that. Yeah. Sounds like a good excuse to do some field work in the Southern Hemisphere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I know. <laughs> Cheers. Thanks very much. Any further questions? I tap one if no one else does. Um, so I guess if there's there's not any further questions. Um, oh, Sorry, no, there are, there's someone in the chat. In yes. The chat, yeah. yeah. So there's a question from Lini Mai to everyone. It says, during modeling of aeromagnetic data, a correction is made for elevation. Does this mean that we should consider something similar for paleomag? Mm. Yeah, diff I think it, uh, difficult, but you don't really know what the underlying terrain was. So if you make then a correction, that's difficult, except if you knew what the underlying terrain was, but you often don't. So I think you should not uh, make a correction based on something you don't know. Yeah. If that answers the question. Yeah. I I was wondering if you could, you know, make make some sort of correction for this, but I think it it would be very difficult. So because yeah, as you say, you don't know what the previous terrain was. I was going to ask though, kind of along those lines, uh, you sampled in several places here, um, and did your um survey in several places here you mentioned that there's another flow that's just come across this summer yeah um, i was already wondering whether it yeah like, flowed over it it would be nice to because then you know what the underlying um, terrain right, was yeah yeah is, are there any do you have any plans to go back or did it flow over a different place i i don't but okay. someone else <laughs> My PhD will end at some point, so that this is not included anymore in it. Fair enough. Yeah. But maybe, yeah. Um, so I think we do still have some time for some questions, um, but if there are no more, then we can move on to the kind of informal catch up at the end. Um, but uh, I will, if you stop your share, I'll just finish up the uh, yeah. presentation with a quick talk about our next talks that are coming up. Um, so um, our next speaker, can you see that? I'm just going to move that out of the way. Next speaker's on the 20, oh, no, that's today. When's our next speaker, <laughs> Greg? <laughs> yeah, oops. Uh, it should be in two weeks' time. All right. Um yeah, I just got my, I get my dates mixed up. 7th of August. Okay. Is Our next speaker is on the 7th of August. Um, and we do have a, do we still have a slot in August? Is this We've still got, correct? We have one slot okay. left in August and it's the last empty slot that we've got for, for this year. Okay. Um, and yes, uh, as I said previously, these will get uploaded to YouTube. Uh, the URL is there for you to click on and we've got more than 100 now for you to view. Um, so thanks everyone for attending. 
I think we're going to stop the recording now and just have an informal catch up.